Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series that we call Refle Reflections in Time was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgie more than 15 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. This is how Paul began many of the 73 interviews that he recorded. It's often exciting to look at the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that helped make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. My name is Jack Newton. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960, and I served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Paul Borgie in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. Today is a very bright and sunny afternoon in the middle of January, year 2000, start of the millennium, and we have with us in the studio Dr. Hugh Cowden. Hugh's an old friend of mine. He's currently retired. He joined the faculty here back in 1968 as a professor of journalism and as chairman of the Department of Journalism back then. And more recently, in the, towards the end of uh, his time here, was chairman of the Communication Department, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute, but it's a, a combined department to join journalism and some other disciplines. Hugh, it's good to have you with us. Thank you, Jack. Uh, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time, but I don't think uh, I've ever asked you much about your beginnings. Uh, how, did you, uh, how did you start out? Where did you come from? From uh, Milwaukee. I grew up in Milwaukee. Uh, went to Marquette High School and Marquette University. Uh, got the bachelor's and master's degree in journalism at Marquette University. And what year was that? The bachelor's in 1953. Mm -hmm. um, the master's degree uh, later, not, and not until 1960, because I went to work uh, and did the master's thesis while I was uh, working at St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana, which mm -hmm. is a liberal arts college about 90 miles southeast of Chicago. Well, that was uh, when you graduated in 53. That was, that was uh, in, in the war years there, Korean War, wasn't well, it? Well, it was. I um, went into the service from 1953 to 55. Ah. It was right after the Korean War ended. Uh, when I came out in 1955, I went, uh, I pursued the master's degree at Marquette in 1955-56 mm -hmm. and then went to work at uh, at the college, St. Joseph's College in, in Indiana. Did you do anything in the military related to your interest? No, I was in the combat engineers. <laughs> but, <laughs> A little different. But I uh, was able to uh, there weren't very many people who had a college degree at that time mm -hmm. and so they made me company clerk, sent me to company clerk school uh, the instructor there said <clears throat> that was the last course he was going to teach and he was going to take one person with him to post headquarters and he chose me and I went to post headquarters for most of my service. This was at Fort Lewis, mm -hmm. Washington and outside Tacoma and I wound up shipping people overseas <laughs> and giving people early releases from the Army to go back to school and when it came to be my turn I wrote myself an early release. Uh -huh. Yeah, but um, anyway, that was the those were the. Now, beginnings. when you finished your tour of duty in the military, then you went back to school. Was it? Uh, when I finished in 1955, 
then came back, worked on the Masters, and in 1956 started at St. Joseph's College in okay. Indiana, and there I was teaching three courses. I was news director, I was sports information director, <laughs> editor of the alumni publication. Kept you plenty busy. I, I should ask you, how did you get interested in journalism to begin with? Well, I was editor of uh, the high school newspaper at, at Marquette High School mm -hmm. in Milwaukee, and um, then when I was a freshman at Marquette University in 1949, I was writing sports for the Milwaukee oh. Journal part-time. And then uh, as in my junior and senior years, I worked virtually full-time uh, for the Milwaukee Broadcasting Company. So your experience station. wasn't entirely in print journalism. No. You did have some broadcast experience, right, too. Right, and then I uh, did that for two years, the junior and senior years at Marquette. And when I came back from the Army in 1955 and was pursuing the master's degree in 1955-56, I went back to WMP and, mm -hmm. uh, and wrote news and sports there. I was writing sports for, uh, well, your viewers wouldn't remember Earl Gillespie, but it was when the Milwaukee, when the Boston Braves came to Milwaukee and uh, became the Milwaukee Braves in 1953. So it was a fun experience. Great. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, if uh, I wish we had a little more time, I'd ask you whether you uh, uh, had any good stories about uh, sports characters that you met back in those days. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, some of them I probably couldn't repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now you've, uh, now you've uh, you've graduated. You got your doctoral degree. Uh, well, I uh, when I was uh, at St. Joseph's, I started pursuing the doc the Ph.D. in 1959 in the summers at the University of Iowa. Okay, so this is St. Joseph's in Rensselaer, Indiana. Yeah, and I w worked there from 1956 to 66. But mm -hmm. in 59, I began work at Iowa during the summers on the, on mm -hmm. the doctorate. And then the year of residence in 1962-63, and then I wrote the uh, most of the dissertation uh, before I left in 66. In 1966, I went to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and taught journalism there and finished the dissertation. And I was at uh, Duquesne from 1966 to 68 finished the dissertation and got the, the uh, doctorate in June, on June 8th of 1968, and on July 9th of 1968, I moved here to Omaha. Uh, so that sounds, uh, sounds like a pretty varied background. You had uh, simultaneously a lot of practical experience yeah. in the uh, world of journalism, yeah. both in uh, print and broadcast media, and yeah. you had uh, the academic experience mm -hmm. uh, uh, working on your doctoral degree at University of Iowa, mm -hmm. and all of this simultaneously. Kind well, of. and it's, at St. Joseph's, it was. Uh, um, I was doing a little freelancing for magazines mm -hmm. there, and I was, uh, but primarily doing public relations at St. Joseph's as news director. So lots of practical experience and teaching experience right. too. Right. Right. Uh, so yeah. a, kind of a Renaissance man. Or well, something, right? it, uh, it was. It kept us busy. I'll, I'll say bet. that. Yeah. Had five kids. At the same so, time, Jack. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So it didn't keep you too busy. <laughs> Not too busy. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so then uh, in 1968, you came to Omaha. What brought right. you here? <clears throat> well, um, Dean Harper, who was the uh, dean, dean of Harper the arts, well. your predecessor yes. as dean at the uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, they were looking for a department chair. Uh, I was at Duquesne at the time, and it was my dissertation advisor at Iowa who told me about this job, and he recommended me for it. And uh, they said, you know, they were looking for a, a chair of the journalism department. And so I came over here for the interview, and that was a kind of a story because I came over here, it was, uh, if I have the dates right, April 4th of 1968 for, to be interviewed. And um, I flew here, went to the prom townhouse that night. Which has since been destroyed in a, in by a tornado. tornado. <laughs> uh, went to bed, woke up, met Bob Harper, the dean, in the uh, office at the prom townhouse. I was two minutes late. He was sitting there. I thought, well, this isn't any way to start <laughs> off. 
I got in his car and he said, pretty tragic news last night. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh. That's probably the only time in my adult life when I hadn't watched the news at night. And I thought, here I am interviewing to be chairman of the journalism department. And I didn't know a thing about it. <laughs> didn't know it. the big news story of the day. Yeah, right. And it was an interesting day to be over here because there was really like a pall on this campus. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed the usual people, you know, I mean, the you know, personnel person. And, of course, Kirk Naylor was, was president, president at mm -hmm. the time before there were chancellors here. Um, and I visited with him. And I visited, one of the people I visited with was Paul Borgie uh, in this building. And I'll never forget that. Now he it, ran the TV operation. He was managing the TV operation. And, uh, but I was struck when I walked into his office and I learned later because he was, uh, you know, in the communication department. Mm -hmm. He had a totally clean desk. <laughs> that really <laughs> astonished me, you know. I thought to myself, what does he do? <laughs> But he was uh, sitting at his desk and just, you know, a very friendly person. And, and uh, another thing that I remember about that day was yourself. You were, huh. we had, uh, I guess there was an opportunity for department chairs to meet me huh. because yeah, I was I was going chairman of the Department of Psychology, Psychology. back then. And uh, you and several other faculty showed up, but, uh, you know, when I came back in the mm -hmm. fall, why I realized whoever might have been invited, you were the one who showed up. <laughs> and it, I remember it very, very favorably, oh, you know. Thank it was you. a good interview. And uh, I enjoyed it here. Um, met several other people. And uh, uh, the people, it was a very small department. Now, what had happened was that um, uh, the journalism department had been in the College of, what was it? Uh, applied, applied Arts and Sciences. Applied Arts. In 1967-68, and they didn't have a chair, and Dean Harper wanted to move it into the College of Arts and Sciences, mm -hmm. so they were looking for somebody with some academic credentials, and I had sure. just gotten the doctorate, and I had had some professional experience, and so I interviewed for the job. I was hired, uh, and when I came here in September of 68, actually it was uh, July. I taught that summer here. Um, uh, the department had just moved into the College of Arts and Sciences. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the university had just joined the University of Nebraska right. state system, which was really very important, you know, for a lot of us who came during that year. Now, if I remember, that College of Applied Arts also had engineering in it, and mm -hmm. the um, Chairman of Engineering was eager to have a separate College of Engineering. Anston Marston, remember him? Uh, vaguely, and, yeah. And uh, yeah. that's so they kicked everybody else out. Uh, you yeah. know, journalism was one of the programs that, uh, uh, that uh, had to leave had if to they leave. were going to have a separate College of Engineering. Yeah. And then, of course, after that, the College of Engineering was taken over by the engineering program at uh, in the University of Nebraska right. Lincoln, and uh, yeah. so we didn't have it anyhow. Yeah. Uh, except as a as an auxiliary program, and well, our offices, uh, the journalism department was right in this engineering building here. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, we were down in the corner on the first floor, but um, we had good relationships with the engineering faculty back then. Do you remember what the campus was like back in those days? Uh, what What are your memories of uh, of UNO? What did you think when you first set foot on the campus? What What the uh, um, what were your first impressions? Um, well, partly that I had been here before, because when I was at St. Joseph's College, I came to a convention here in 1957. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, started at that college in 56. In the summer of 57, I came over here. And uh, the convention was downtown, at one of the hotels downtown. And they took us to Exarbon. And For the horse races? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. And I remember riding on this bus back to the hotel downtown, coming down Dodge Street, and I remember seeing 
the administration building, which is now Arts and Science Hall, from Dodge. And I thought, this is really, for a campus in the middle of a city, this is a pretty attractive place, you know, with the Memorial Park to the north yes. and all of that. And uh, so when I came back here, it wasn't brand new. Uh, but I was still very impressed with the, the western feel of the yeah. place, you know. It's diff I came from Pittsburgh. I mean, I had been in Pittsburgh for two years. And this just seemed to be wide open spaces, and and uh, the, uh, the the campus there wasn't a lot on it, but I think um, Allwine Hall was just going up at the time. Mm -hmm. The gymnasium was here, of course, engineering building. The uh, field house, not the hyper building that we know today. Not the hyper right. building, no. I remember meeting Ellen Lord, the old. Uh, yeah, now that's uh, something interesting. Back in those days. Uh, you met everybody. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you knew everybody. I think the um, uh, people being interviewed for faculty positions today would be a little bit surprised at just how many people you met as in the process of being interviewed. That's because right. It wasn't just the people in your department. No. It was everybody. That's right. That's right. That was, um, as it turned out by hindsight, I was, I, uh, was favorably impressed with this place. You mentioned Ellen Lord. She was a director yeah. of the library back then. That's right. right. That's right. Um, and a great person. And a great person. I, I've always considered it ironic that she was replaced by John Christ, yes. C-H-R-I-S-T, right. which was a, an odd sort of right. juxtaposition. But anyway, yeah, she was a good person. <laughs> um, so we took to... Uh, UNO and to the city of Omaha right away, but I had a, a pretty unfortunate beginning because I had to have a gall, my gallbladder out, and I was in the hospital. I remember, uh, and remember that. I, I remember visiting. It was an Emanuel Hospital, an Emanuel, old Emanuel the old Emanuel Hospital. Emanuel hospital. Yeah. It was so old that during the operation I got staph infection, Ooh. and I was out for about a month. The here, the first semester I'm here. I mean, I'm sure that Dean Harper thought, you know, who did I hire? He never, he never shows up. But I got some things done in the hospital, Jack. I, I quit smoking and grew the beard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still is. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it was a tough entry. Uh, our youngest son had a blood disease. We thought he had leukemia. And he's okay now. He's 36 years old and doing fine. But uh, back then, we thought the worst. Uh, my mother had died during the first semester, and so we thought, gee, you know, this, uh, maybe this might Omaha be bad news. news. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it didn't turn out to be, though, thank no, goodness. No, no. So everything straightened out, and, uh, and uh, What you was know. the student body like back then when you first came here? Do you remember much of that? Right? Well, I remember uh, mainly the bootstrappers. Uh, because bootstrappers, that was a military program. Right. Where people who were... Many of them um, beginning in the military back in the Second World War, even yeah, uh, in order to keep their status as officers, had to complete a, a um, complete a college degree. Right, and this was a program that uh, had been worked out between, if I remember correctly, it was President Bale and General LeMay, wasn't it? To to well, uh, uh, something like that to allow yes. people to. Uh, to do that, and they got an administrative leave to finish a doctoral degree if they could do it within yeah. a certain amount of time. And we got a lot of those. We got a doctoral degree. I mean, I, I'm sorry, a bachelor's, bachelor's degree, degree. yes. Yeah. Uh, we uh, did get a lot. A lot of them. I remember, what, six, seven hundred people a year sometimes graduating from that program. Yeah, well, I remember them so clearly because um, when we got here, and I remember these dates so clearly, on July 9th, and, and, and Dean Harper had uh, there were no moving expenses back then, but he let me teach the second half of the summer session. And I remember walking into those two courses in the second summer session, and they were mostly bootstrappers. Mm -hmm. They were relatively small classes. Mm -hmm. And I found out very quickly, you know, how serious most of these people were about their, about their uh, academic work. The other students work. used to call them curve breakers. <coughs> <coughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, that I really enjoyed those classes and got to know them pretty well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, of course, they the, the numbers decreased as we over the years. But yes. uh, that was my introduction, and that was a good group. I yes. enjoyed them too. Yeah.
Yeah. The other thing I that should I tell you, though, huh? maybe I shouldn't tell you, but um, he said that you came right after we became part of the state system. And right. Early on, then they, they were not allowing uh, moving expenses. But when I came here, they eight did. years earlier, it was yeah. everything was negotiated with the president, and uh, oh. I said, Dr. Bale, I can't come here unless you pay my moving <laughs> expenses. I need to. Yeah. No, he did better than pay my moving expenses. He said, well, he says, I um, don't want to set a precedent of paying, but suppose I give you $1,500 a year more in salary, which of course was great because that continued on. <laughs> when did they quit that? Yeah. <laughs> 1965, when Dr. Bale retired. Yeah, I, I suppose. suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, uh, you're here in Omaha, and you're, um, you're chairman of the uh, journalism department. Mm -hmm. And uh, and things were were moving quite rapidly back then because we were become we'd become part of the state university. We had a huge influx of students, if I remember. Right, and faculty, and and a lot of new faculty. Yeah. Now, did you yeah. hire a lot of new faculty at that? Well, we um, maybe, maybe I should ask first of all, how large was the journalism? It department? was only four faculty. Four faculty. Uh, myself and Joe McCartney, Warren Frankie, and and Doreen Simpson at mm -hmm. that time. Uh, who was the wife of Bob Simpson in sociology. in sociology. There were four of us. Uh, we were allocated a new line in 1970. We, we uh, hired a person who stayed only one year. Um, but then it was in 1971 that uh, we needed a, a full-time person in advertising and public relations. We were hiring part-time people. And that's when we were able to hire Bob Riley right. in 1971. He was a partner down at Holland Reeves and Riley downtown. And a great addition to the department. Yeah, he but came. In fact, he's been interviewed in this series too. Good, and, uh, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was hired here, and I was very fortunate because uh, when I hired him, <coughs> it was a Sunday night when I had. Uh, talked on the phone to a fellow at Michigan State. He had called. He was coming in on Monday. He had called on Sunday night to tell me he couldn't make it. So I woke up on Monday morning in, in 1971. It was in April, something like that. And we had this line and nobody to fill it. And I got in my car and I went downtown to visit with Bob Riley, whom i had only met once. Bob had run for Congress in 1970, yes. and I'd met him then. I walked into his office, and uh, um, th this is a better, really a better story for people who know Bob, right? and most people know him. That's uh, the whole in thing. Omaha, right. Yeah, as writer and speaker and so forth. He had been with Holland Reeves and Riley for about five years, I guess. He'd been at Creighton before that. Yes. And... Uh, I walked into his office, just cold. I had called and made sure he was going to be there. Sat down and I said, uh, we have an opening in advertising and public relations in the journalism department at, at UNO. Would you be interested in coming back to academe? And he just looked at me and he said, I was talking to my wife over the weekend about that very thing. And it was a, a go from the start. But he needed a year to clear up his, he had public yeah. relations and advertising contracts. So he started with us in the fall of 72 and retired in 87. But it was, uh, yeah, he was a, a terrific addition yes, to the university. Yeah. And maybe we can talk about some of them uh, later as we go along. But I remember a, a number of other people that you had sometimes on you know, short-term contracts. but. Yeah. Uh, Interesting right. people over the years that you've had. Well, both full time and part time. We yeah. had some very interesting, uh, very interesting part time people from the media in Omaha here. Mm -hmm. Number of people from the World Herald as well as some from the broad uh, TV stations. And that was one of the advantages, as I saw it. I, I presume you saw it the same way, but let me ask you yeah. uh, that we did use people from the. Um, from the local media, from yes. the um, uh, you mentioned the World Herald, from mm -hmm. the radio, some and certainly television stations sometimes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I w would see that as facilitating our program, giving the students some closer experience with uh, with real sure. real world circumstances, sure. uh, and filling out um, our, our faculty in the sense that. Uh, 
we might be able to get people from, uh, let's say, the local newspaper mm -hmm. who were specialists in some area that we didn't have on the faculty. Sure. Right. And we made use of, uh, you can overdo this, and in later years, um, you know, it became, because part-time people are not here to do some of the other things like advising and uh, committee meetings yes. and all of that, but uh, they serve a crucial purpose in, in plugging in um, and bringing their own experiences mm -hmm. to the classroom and to the department here. Uh, we, um, uh, so when we hired Bob Riley, it, it was a full-time faculty member now who was in charge of advertising mm -hmm. and public relations. and. We kept hiring part-time people, but not as many, and uh, mm -hmm. you know it, it was a better balance. I remember so. one interesting, it just occurred to me, I haven't thought of him for years, but he was, a, uh, he'd been a newspaper editor, editor of the Hartford uh, Current, I think. Well, that was Bob Eddy. Yes, yes. Right. He, uh, that was when Warren Frankie went on leave to finish his doctorate, okay. and Bob Eddy, we were still a journalism department then. I think I'm right. Yeah, and I been, forget exactly what he'd been in do. some program at Harvard, or well, I can't remember. He had some affiliation there. I well, guess. he had, um, yeah. But his main thing was that he was uh, uh, he'd gotten his degree at the University of Minnesota. He was mm -hmm. he was editor of the Hartford Courant at the time, mm -hmm. oldest newspaper perhaps yes. in the country, and um, continuing newspaper, if I'm right about that. But um, yeah, we hired him for a year, and he was, of course, a character. Yes, a very interesting yes. character. He, <laughs> he was the, he had had throat cancer, mm -hmm. and so he could only talk in a whisper. And the students, um, uh, you know, were taken by him right from the start because they had to listen very closely to yeah. pay attention. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, but there were a number of others as well who, contributed to the program. Well, let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, about the uh, program itself. Yeah. Uh, now, you started in, in the, as chairman of the journalism right. department, right? but um, that didn't last forever because uh, shortly after I became dean, I think, you um, kind of merged with two other departments. Well, I was going to mention that one of, the, uh, one of the attractive things about coming here in 1968 was the fact that it was a new university, that is, a new state university, mm -hmm. and Every, everything was not carved in stone, as it is with more established universities. And you know, so uh, I'm partly thinking of the politics of it. You could yeah. still; it was flexible enough that you could create new entities, is what I'm saying. And um, broadcasting, broadcast journalism was being taught by the journalism department, and broadcast production was being taught by the speech department. And so for uh, several years, from 1971 on, Jack Brillhart and I primarily were talking about Jack the Jack Brillhart was I, the yes, chair of speech, of the speech, speech department. Mm -hmm. Yes, I should have said that. He, uh, he and I talked about this for several years, and um, finally in, and it was, the catalyst was broadcasting, because mm -hmm. we were both involved in that. When now the... When you uh, say broadcasting, you're talking about both radio and television? Yes. Yes. Right. And uh, both journalism and broadcast production. Um, and uh, we, um, well, as I say, that was the catalyst. And, and by 1975, we had, had pretty well had it worked out mm -hmm. uh, and, and went ahead with your support at that time because you had become dean with a uh, proposal and a 19 se to merge, and in 1975, why the two departments merged into the Department of Communication, and we suddenly went from a pretty small entity in journalism to a uh, pretty large department. Mm -hmm. um, well, by that time, there had already been some changes in the speech department because they used to have dramatic arts well, as part of speech, that's right. too. And that's partly the reason why they had gone into broadcasting right. was because they had had dr drama in right. their department. Then when the College of Fine Arts was created in, what, 70 or 71? Somewhere around there, 70 and 71. Yeah, the uh, dramatic arts became their own department. In the College of Fine Arts, speech then had lost that, mm -hmm. that discipline 
and uh, they were emphasizing broadcasting and uh, broadcast production. So by that time, why uh, it made sense to merge the two departments because we were both interested in some of the same academic uh -huh. disciplines. So, so what were the uh, what were the facilities like for uh, for the broadcast part of it? Did you uh, did you have a uh, did, was um, did we have a radio station back then, or how did the students learn? Well, we had a uh, we had a little radio production studio back then, um, but the TV facilities were right here. Were these at KYNE? We um, which was quite different. That was Moeba back then, wasn't well, it? Well, it's yes, yeah. but um, which nobody remembers anymore. <laughs> but this turned out to be very well. The the uh, journalism department had been working for quite a while. Joe McCartney had been working with the uh, uh, particularly the TV studios here. Yeah, I mentioned Moeba. Okay, that's uh, Metropolitan Omaha Educational right. Broadcasting yeah. uh, Association, and that. Right. Worked in conjunction with the Omaha Public Schools mm -hmm. to deliver educational programming to the right. schools. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and we had been working with uh, with TV as well, lesser uh, to a lesser degree radio. They were across the campus. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have quite as much, but the students produced student documentaries for mm -hmm. the TV station, and. Uh, uh, the facilities that you asked about turned out to be uh, very, very advantageous for the department because in, in subsequent evaluations after 1975, why outside people who came here to evaluate the program really thought this was a wonderful arrangement because on most campuses, the academic uh, arm, the depa academic department of the university uh, was not able to make use of the campus television facilities. So it worked out well. So it really worked out well. I mean, uh, the, you know, people who came to uh, to evaluate the program really were impressed with uh, with this arrangement. But anyway, in 1975, then when we did merge, why uh, then we we established curriculum, got the faculty together, and. Um, uh, became the Department of Communication with three majors in journalism, in broadcasting, and in speech communication. Mm -hmm. And then we um, uh, also, speech had had a master's degree, mm -hmm. and we turned that into a master's degree in communication and integrated mass communication and uh, speech communication in the, mm -hmm. in the graduate program. And suddenly, you know, where journalism had about 70 majors, and I think, I don't know how many people, how many majors speech had, but uh, not many more than a total of 100 mm -hmm. between the two of us. Ultimately, we were a, a department of more than 600 people with uh, students, you know, and, and a graduate program that had more than 100 people in it. Now, if I remember correctly, uh, it's been a lot of years now, but yeah. uh, for a while there, you had two department chairmen simultaneously. Well, right? in, in the fall of 75, when we uh, uh, merged, the agreement was that we would have the current chair of the speech department, who was Don Knepfler, and myself as co-chair. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that um, this wasn't really a uh, satisfactory arrangement, particularly to the speech faculty. And so in, the, uh, in January of, of 76, why I became the chair, and uh, it wasn't uh, difficult in the, for the fact that Don had never finished his doctorate mm -hmm. uh, at the University of Iowa, and so I became the chair of the mm -hmm. merged department. And I have to say that was, uh, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful challenge to bring the two departments together. And they had tried it occasionally around the country in, in, in places or other universities around the country. It really didn't work very well because did of it, politics. And did so it help that. any that you, in addition to journalism, had this, uh, at least one other discipline, the broadcast discipline, in your background that you'd, you'd worked in, uh, in radio? Uh, it helped to, uh, yeah, and I had done my uh, doctoral dissertation essentially in speech, that is, ah, in persuasion. Okay. So that... Um, you know, it helps to have had exposure. To so you were the right person at the right time, I well, guess. Well, it was just uh, fortunate. 
that yeah. I had that kind of background. But uh, well, it was an unusual background in another way, if I remember correctly. I mean, you had both the academic credentials, the doctoral degree, mm -hmm. and the uh, experience. And mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, didn't you have a a lot of recruiting problems and uh, for a while there with uh, because you could find people with uh, <laughs> with one set of credentials but not the other. And, well, uh, particularly in mass communication, in incidentally, Jack, during this time we're talking, uh, if it sounds like we're talking an awful lot about journalism and mass communication, I certainly don't mean to slight the speech of course uh, curriculum and and so forth but uh, there was a lot of activity you're right in trying to recruit particularly people for broadcasting the problem in the mass media trying to recruit academic people is that the expect the 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 um, professional expectation that is the expectation from by the media is that the pers the people who are going to be teaching have up-to-date professional experience. The expectation of the academic community is that they have uh, hopefully a doctorate. And some research background. And some research background. And so consequently finding people who can meet all of these qualifications is, is I would submit, tougher than it is in some other disciplines, you know, where you just have to worry about the academic background. And so we had trouble in broadcasting for a while and people came, were coming in here for a year and then you know, no longer than two, and I could go through names, but uh, there were some I can't even remember anymore. Right. But that worked out in the uh, 80s and into the mid and later 1980s to be really to solidify. We have, I think, one of the best broadcasting faculties in the country right now. Really? In Jeremy Lipschultz, Mike Hilt, and Chris Allen. They all have good professional experience. They all have their PhDs. And they're all uh, writing and doing research. And it's, uh, it's not easy to recruit people who have qualifications in both the professional well, I remember the many discussions you and I, know, I have you about I it in years gone that's by. That's right. That's right. But that's, um, you know, over the years why, uh, as a matter of fact, if I may say, as long as we're on the subject, um, by the the middle 90s, we may have been the only uh, uh, journalism and mass communication faculty. I'm talking about the 10, approximately 10 out of the 21 faculty members who teach mass communication. We may be the only department uh, that uh, had all the, whose faculty in those areas all have doctorates. Mm -hmm. This isn't a big item with the professional field. They, right. they don't much care about it, but uh, certainly academically. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that um, I don't know of any other universities offhand that might have everybody with a PhD. And all of them have good professional experience in their backgrounds, so we're pretty proud of the faculty. Well, tell me now, we, we've talked about the beginning of the uh, communication department mm -hmm. and we talked a little, little bit about what it was like. Uh, mm -hmm. What, um, since, since it began, what sort of changes have you seen over the years in the time that you were department chairman? Uh, changes at UNO or Change, well, in the field? Well, uh, that, uh, but changes in the department particular. Yeah. Um, well, did the, the, did the program change much? Uh, did the number of students or the quality of the students change much? Uh, did the interests of the students? The interests primarily are what mm -hmm. changed. I think the, over the particularly last 15 years, um, uh, th there has been less and less interest, uh, fewer people in print, print mm -hmm. journalism. There are still people in print journalism, and I've been out of it now for four years, so I don't know the numbers anymore. But when I left in 95, why, there had been something of a decrease in people who were interested in print journalism, and a corresponding increase of people interested in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. um, the speech uh, majors, the number of speech majors, although they were always fewer, were increasing. Uh, through the 90s mm -hmm. uh, to the time I left. We always had classes that were about at capacity. I mean, we always had heavy enrollment in this department. Um, um, most classes closed during the registration mm -hmm. week. Well, of course, you had the university requirement that um, 
students must have a course in public speaking, and that I'm yes. sure uh, uh, oh, yeah. swelled the ranks of the speech classes quite considerably. Yeah, it did. Um, but, you know, people who are interested in uh, organizational communication and interpersonal communication, political communication, those numbers have increased, mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge. And, and, of course, we built faculty that had diverse interests in all of those areas. And uh, um, rhetoric uh, is a traditional area that uh, probably lower numbers of students there than, than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, continuing... We've always had a fairly good interest in uh, forensics and that's, debate. I yeah. was just about to mention that. Yeah, there's always been a successful uh, program in forensics and debate. Um, you know, they've, they've sure. uh, over the years, developed a good reputation under Dwayne Ashenbrenner and his successors in that area. So, can you think of any uh, any particular uh, changes in the curriculum or in the department or anything that that really stands out that you're uh, uh, maybe that you're proud of having uh, having had a hand in or that uh, um, uh, that that changed over the years for one reason or another. Well. The first thing I, I, uh, that needs mentioning is the internship, the professional internship program, mm -hmm. whereby students um, uh, work downtown for the various media. And uh, we, when I got here in 68, uh, there were two or three internships, primarily at Channel 3. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, in, well, we developed that program so that we had dozens of people, maybe over a hundred a year, who were working downtown. We we give them credit, two hours of credit, mm -hmm. for an internship working at the World Herald and the TV and radio stations and Cox Cable. Five and with faculty supervision. With at the faculty same time. supervision, mm -hmm. there was always a faculty member, sometimes two, who who uh, it was part of their load to oversee the sure. internships. It was, I consider, a grew into a very successful internship program, and it's the first thing that students will cite, the majors will cite, as, as valuable. Is well, they were required. I, I, I we think required. People, people know about this when you're talking in, let's say, an education college, and everybody takes practice teaching, and right. they say, well, yes, our students get a chance to get into the classroom and practice the profession that they're you know, learn about the profession from in a practical way, uh, yeah. but we don't often think of um, uh, of uh, of communication and journalism and so on as being as having that same uh, feature. And uh, what you're saying, what you're telling me, is that your department made that a requirement for your students well, as well, we, so that you're you're equivalent to the practice teaching in the uh, education college. Yes, and uh, eventually we had enough employers downtown mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, there were enough internships for all the majors so Wonderful. that we could make it a requirement. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was intriguing when I came here, see when I w had been at Duquesne in Pittsburgh, the Department of Journalism there had had a few internships and it was hard working in a city that big for whatever reason with with people downtown. Here it was like a, 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 a metropolitan laboratory mm -hmm. and everybody was so friendly in the media downtown and they were all willing to sometimes it was self-serving but we tried to make sure that the students got a real professional experience out of it they weren't just gophers sure and so uh, we developed uh, internships very easily relatively quickly but the thing that was appealing I mean I thought of that when I came here because the city was the right size to work with the outlets, the media outlets, and I'm talking also about places like Mutual of Omaha and public relations and so forth. The city was the right size that you could get to know people. You know, you could call virtually CEOs and they'd come in and talk to your class. Uh, it was an easy city to work in and it was an easy place to develop an internship program. And uh, th uh, many of those internships, of course, led into full-time jobs mm -hmm. afterwards. We've got full-time people all over the city here and, and beyond. Sounds like a, a great experience for students. Well, it is, and it uh, was part of the what made, that made life interesting here, uh, plus, of course, 
the relative age of the students, mm -hmm. you know, particularly in night courses when you could go in and teach people who had a lot of background behind them. Mm -hmm. And these are people who wouldn't be in class unless they were serious about their academic work. And it was those elements. That's here. always been a strength, I think. Of, I think uh, this so. Since back in the days when, certainly when it was a municipal university and maybe even before that. Yes, very much so. And, and it's not just myself talking. You know, other faculty feel, sure. feel the same way. Yeah. That, uh, I those, certainly did. I had one student in class who was uh, 82. Hmm. And I forget his last name, but his name was Joe. And he, mine was his last class in mass communication and public opinion, but uh, to get a degree. And he, he, he really, I gave him a C. He he wasn't really quite with it at that <laughs> age, but I gave him a gentleman C. He got his degree. He died six months later, yeah. but he had fulfilled a goal, you know. And uh, that's, well, we have we have a lot of people. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was that's part of the satisfying yeah, thing. Certainly, great. the students. Uh, and we were doing it. You know, it's popular now to offer courses for senior citizens like you and me. Yeah. But uh, um, but we were doing it years and years ago when I first came yes. here back four well, years ago. That's one of the pluses here, right. I think, at this university. Well, we have another uh, ten or twelve minutes left. Uh, maybe we could spend at least part of it uh, kind of reminiscing about people that you know. We've mentioned a number of names as we've gone along here. Um, can you think of any people that stand out? Uh, you mentioned Bob Harper, for example, as mm -hmm. a person that hired you. He was always one of my favorites. Uh, I think he was a great dean of, uh, uh, of arts and sciences. But um, uh, and a. Uh, Gentleman and a scholar uh, at the uh, same time. Uh, but can you think of other people? Uh, well, Bob, I'll, I'll just turn it over to you. Well, Bob yeah. is still a friend. Right. He's, uh, you know, we have, uh, we were able to buy this cabin out in the mountains in Colorado near Estes Park. Oh, that's where you've been spending there. your retirement years. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Four months a year and during the summer. And Bob Harper lives out there, and he's 86 years old, and he is doing okay. He, uh, you know, his, his knees are bad, but other than that, he's uh, sharp as a whip. So... For those of you who might tune in here, he's doing fine. Yes. Yeah. I had a nice note from him at Christmas time, yeah. too. Yeah. But um, uh, there are people who, Del Weber, of course, I, I was um, had the opportunity to be president of the faculty senate in 85, 86. And, uh, oh, that's something we should have mentioned earlier. I'd uh, neglected that, right. You were faculty senate president. That right. means you were elected from the, uh, first of all, to the faculty senate, and then you were elected by your colleagues in the senate to yeah. be the president, faculty well, senate president. It was uh, a fascinating year. I enjoyed it a lot. It was during the time when we had, uh, in 1985, 86, we had the budget, serious budget crunch because of the uh, downturn in agriculture, mm -hmm. and we had to, B.J. Reed was uh, the vice president, we had to go down and testify twice before the legislature trying to hold the budget up sure. here. And then during that year, why I had, uh, they were talking about, they meaning the legislature among others, greater accountability in terms of what the students were achieving here. Back then they called it value added. Right. I don't know what they call it now, but uh, how do you track students from the first year to the fourth year in a way that tells you how much they've learned? It's part of so the whole accountability, accountability uh, that's thing. been with us. So there was a, there is a university, Truman University in um, uh, it used to be Northeast Missouri uh, University, mm -hmm. and uh, now it's Truman State, I guess they call it. Well, uh, Chancellor Weber and uh, Vice Chancellor Bauer and the Regent Kermit Hansen and myself, when I was heading the Senate, uh, drove in February down to Kirksville, I believe it is, mm -hmm. in a snowstorm. And um, Del Weber is uh, uh, known for his driving skills. Yes, he he tells stories about himself. Oh, yes, that's right. right. Sometimes. Well, it was uh, it was a, a, a fairly hairy ride because uh, periodically, why uh, Chancellor Weber would decide, I wonder how icy these roads are, <laughs> and he would be going 40, 40, 45 miles an hour and put on the brakes. And one time we wound up 
on the side of the road, <laughs> and he scared people half to death. But he thought it was part of the routine about driving in a snowstorm. So we got down there, and then unfortunately Dell's back went out when we were down there. And so uh, Regent Hansen took over the wheel on the way back and made sure that he didn't put on the brakes while the roads were icy. But it was a, uh, a memorable trip, to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I Thomas Hansen, of course, one of the more memorable people right. on the Board of Regents that's back right. in those days. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. I remember he used to attend classes, and you'd think... Uh, you think the faculty members wouldn't care for that too much, to have a member of the Board of Regents sitting in on their class and checking up on him, but once they got to know him, they found out that he was, uh, that this was a great thing, and uh, there was people who vied to have him come to their classes. Well, I think that's right, yeah. I remember that he had been scheduled to... Because uh, he was always so interested and interesting. Well, yes, and he was genuinely interested yes, in, was. in the academic uh, community and what was going on. He was scheduled to... Um, uh, come to one of my classes once, but he didn't show up. He had other things that, uh, you know, maybe he thought I would give him an exam or something like that. <laughs> but, um, oh, I don't know. It's, uh, I would certainly, um, having worked so closely with you, Jack, for 20 years, and, and uh, it was uh, enjoyable all the way. I, I had... Uh, well, that's very kind of you to say that. <laughs> well, it, um, it, uh, I think we, as you say, um, Developed a, a long friendship, uh, brought together by a good martini. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> I remember a trip we took down to Mexico together right, with our families, with our wives. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And that was uh, that was memorable. That was a lot of fun. I remember I always got better hotel rooms than you did. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, tried to figure it out, and we figured it was because you were wearing a beard. <laughs> Thanks. So. Yeah. Well, it was. Uh, yeah, we had. Um, you know some good times and the um, service on you know college advisory committee and educational it was just fun to be involved in developing back in 1979 we uh, along with Kent Kerwin and um, uh, Gordon Mundell Kent was of course chair of the political science department that's right and Gordon Mundell in English department yeah the uh, linguistics professor and several other people uh, redid the college requirements uh, mm -hmm. as a part of the Educational Policy Committee, I guess. Well, those requirements, I think, by and large, still remain mm -hmm. on the books, and they were fairly rigid, fairly tough requirements, you know, where everybody is required to take, what is it, 12 hours of, uh, of science and, and at least college algebra, and those are requirements mm -hmm. that... Uh, Twelve. You know, Hours of natural science, 12 hours of social science, 12 right. hours of humanities. Right. And uh, to my knowledge, those are still in place. Yeah, I think they've changed by an hour or so in the natural sciences because it was a little difficult to work out with some of these five-hour lab courses and so mm -hmm. on to come out with mm -hmm. some students who were scared that it was 12 hours yeah. <laughs> were uh, didn't want to take 13. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but... Uh, but um, that was a, a fairly tough year because it's very difficult, as you know better than anybody, how difficult it is to get serious curriculum changes passed yes. through the faculty. And, and uh, we ended up, were you part of the, um, part of the project that uh, ended up with, a, uh, with all of the colleges agreeing on some minimum set of, uh, uh, of general education requirements? That came later. Yeah. Uh, quite a bit later, because that's an even tougher job. To yes, get done. a very tough job. At, no, I wasn't involved in that committee. I remember yeah. Jack Kasher, the physics yeah, professor, right. was, and uh, uh, but not directly. No, mm -hmm. no. So, other memorable characters? <laughs> <laughs> Any you can think of? Well, how about in your own department? We talked about uh, Bob sure. Riley and Bob Eddy, for example. Uh, well, I want to mention uh, uh, Deb Smith Howell, Deborah Smith Howell. She's who, the current chair of yes, the Department of Communication. Current chair. She succeeded me as chair, and she has uh, just done a wonderful job um, with uh, with the department and continuing its its growth and its progress. And uh, she's on top of everything. I think she's I see her uh, regularly at UNO hockey games these yeah. days. She's got uh, a, seats right near mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's she's right. She's a big yeah. fan. Yes, she is, and so is her husband. Right. Yeah, but um, yeah, she's done uh, a marvelous job. There are 
of course, uh, uh, people who have done considerable research and writing in the department, like Bruce Johansson, who okay. has been publishing books on Native American. And he was a great addition to the faculty as well. A little unusual addition. If well, you wanted to. Yeah, he, um, in the fact that he uh, stutters. Mm -hmm. And he has a severe stutter. And I remember that this was one of the times I was proudest of the faculty because Bruce came in, as I recall, in 1982. He came here for an interview after he had been at a number of other places interviewing, and he has a marvelous uh, resume, uh, you know, with a Ph.D. from the University of Washington and, and reporter for the Seattle Times and so forth. He would go to different universities to interview. Once he got to the interview, they would find a reason not to hire him because of his stuttering. Mm -hmm. So when he came here uh, to apply, and he later said this was the last time he was going to risk rejection mm -hmm. at a college. And he came here, and he was in competition with another applicant who was virtually as strong as, mm -hmm. as Bruce. But he didn't win points at his interview. And so uh, after we had interviewed them both, and I remember a rump session of the whole department faculty in the hallway in Arts and Science Hall. And uh, I was able to take a vote right there. Which one did they want? And unanimously they voted for Bruce, stuttering or not. You know? And it turns out and that he's extremely well received yes, by his students as well. He does exactly, a great job with him. Exactly. And he's been, uh, I don't know how many books now, maybe he's up past eight. I don't know. But uh, a marvelous addition. Great addition to it. But I was just proud of the faculty because they could have done the same thing other universities had done, and nobody uh, objected to that uh, hire. So um, we're getting getting along towards the end of our session here. Well, you want to have any one more quick uh, thing you want to add? Well, I um, our certainly my relationships with other people in, in you know, Lou Cartier and Tim Fitzgerald over in University Relations and, and uh, you know, a number of the administrators. It's like they're in the same professional discipline you're That's right? right. But other administrators, you know, we have an unusually large number in the past of people coming back to our department, like Elton Carter, who's right. the graduate dean, and Otto Bauer, and uh, about the only high-level administrator that wasn't on our faculty was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been an interesting session, Hugh, and I really appreciate your coming in to well, join I, us this afternoon. And uh, I appreciate your inviting. It's, uh, it's been fun. Yeah. I've, uh, <laughs> it isn't, I don't get to talk to you that often anymore now that you're retired. It's, but well, it's, uh, now that you're by and large retired, yeah. I will. Well, I'm not retired. Talk. I'm doing this now, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad you are. It's yeah. uh, it's a great. Uh, well, I want to keep up that tradition that Paul started. I think it's a great one. Paul is another one of those administrators who was a member of our right. faculty. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, I've enjoyed it a lot. Okay. Well, uh, I thank you again for joining us. And uh, we thank our audience for joining us today, too, in a visit with Dr. Hugh Cowden, who is the retired professor of journalism and a longtime chair of the communication department at UNO. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.